Okay, well, uh, welcome Theodore to another episode of a chess lifestyle interview. Um, well, okay, actually this isn't supposed to be an interview, so yeah, it's probably going to be more of a conversation, but uh, yeah, my first question for you in general is, yeah, just like, who are you? Uh, what is your chess background? Actually, I don't even know this. Uh, so yeah, tell me all about it. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me on your show. Ah, no problem. Uh, no worries. Uh, uh, who am I? My name is Teodor Ivanovsky. I come from Macedonia. Uh, I've been playing chess since I'm 13 years old, which is quite late. Oh, that's quite late. Damn, very, okay. Yeah, it's very late. Uh, I live in Skopje and currently a high school student. Okay, right, right, right. So, um, as I understand, actually, you graduated, is it this year or you're still like you're graduating this year so you're still in school yeah, right I'm graduating this i year. see i see okay okay um uh well before i ask about like your future plans uh, i also wanted to ask you like yeah wh- how, how did we meet uh yes uh me and michael met uh, i think uh, michael and his friend um uh, who are you with i can't remember his name Where's... ah daniel oh okay My... daniel, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 uh, Michael and one of his students came over to Skopje uh, because his student was playing an open. Uh, and I don't know if Michael's mentioned this, but he's good friends with Nikola, uh, another Macedonian person. So he came for a, a vacation slash tutoring partner for Daniel. Yeah. And before the tournament, uh, we organized like a little training camp where me, him, and a couple of other people practiced some chess, uh, where Michael was our teacher professor. Right, right. And yeah, it was, it was kind of cool because, uh, I mean, actually a lot of these uh, Macedonian kids, like if I could call you guys kids, like, um, yeah, you were like, some, some of you were even stronger than me. So it was interesting, like giving a class to you guys and just making sure I could find content that you guys would find useful. Um, but I, I also remember specifically, Teodor, that uh, I showed one example where I made like a big blunder uh, in a game and you were the only one to also make the same blunder as me. So this was, this was a nice... Uh, a nice thing to remember uh, during the sessions. Yeah, I'll probably I'll I'll get up the board later to to show uh, which which blunder I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I don't remember this one. Ah, it was the curse of uh, being an intuitive player. Like we both blundered a checkmate sequence. Um, yeah, I, I yeah uh, I'll I'll show you later. Um, but yeah, the the main reason why uh, you know I've I've made this made this call happen is because uh Tedo, you managed to gain 352 fide rating in one month which is uh absolutely phenomenal so uh, I, I like i basically wanted to hear like you know the whole story like behind that like what was the work that went into it what was going on during it and then what was the kind of like after effects of it so uh I'm just going to very quickly get up uh, Theodore's uh, FIDE profile and then like, I'm, I'm very interested to hear everything uh, uh, that, yeah, that you have to share with the, with the viewers about this incredible, incredible grind. So I'll just get this up uh, on screen and get you back. Okay, so yeah, that should be showing for everyone. Mm, yeah, uh, I started uh, playing chess at a very young, very old age of 13 uh-huh. years old. Uh, but uh, luckily for me, I had amazing coaches. My first coach was Grandmaster Dragolub, Dragolubia Cimovic. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that. Gold medalist. What? I, I'm not going to repeat that name. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't try to. <laughs> you can call him Dragon. So. Dragon. Oh, okay, Dragon. Okay, so yeah, I met, I met yeah. Dragon. Yeah, right, right, right. I see. Oh. He's an Olympic gold medalist, uh, which is a very <laughs> big achievement. He's the only person to get a gold medal in Macedonia's history. Okay. But he's, he was a great coach. He coached me for four years about. Then before the before going to Czechia, uh, before that great result, uh, I started working with uh, Grandmaster Trai Konedev. He's a very famous coach. He's a very good coach, an international coach. And yeah, that was the boost that I needed to help me cross that threshold 
I'd been right. plateau. You can call it a plateau or stagnation of around 1900, uh -huh. I think, for some time. But following uh, a very poor performance in Serbia, which was uh, actually me and Michael played the same tournament. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Uh, he was playing the A tournament, he was playing the B tournament. Makes a big difference. Uh, <laughs> yes. In general, the B tournaments have these Chinese, Mongolians, every mm -hmm. Asian person, Indians. They are very underrated uh, and a lot better for their strength. And yeah, I lost a lot of points. But I think what was very important that is I didn't give up. Uh, I really wanted to keep playing chess. Right. Uh, yeah, I have a couple. As well. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple questions first. So the the first one is like when you said your coach was Dragon. I just wanted to clarify. Like, was this like in a in a club or was this like one on one? Uh, both actually. Okay. Um, for for the start of our work together, it was one on one. But from my club, we got group lessons. We started having, I think, these two years ago. Okay. With both Taiko and Dragon, uh, which was uh -huh. amazing for everybody. Yeah. Uh, because we got twice a week practice with these amazing, wow. uh, amazing nice. coaches. Nice. Okay, okay. And I guess like all of you within that group are a similar level and you all pay a little bit and then it makes it... Or how did that work? Yeah, so... Uh... From the group, you know, not. I think I was the only one from my club uh, and Kido as well. Uh, okay. Uh, from, from the club Alkalid and Alkalid's lessons with the group lessons were free. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. While the individual lessons with the grandmasters were paid. Right. Right. But yeah. In, compared to the market in general, uh, they were very cheap because yeah. here in Macedonia, uh, Macedonia is a weaker economy, so uh -huh. everything is a bit cheap. Right. 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 Yeah. As I remember well. It was some good times. Uh, but yeah, I also wanted to ask, like, uh, actually, when you got your new coach, uh, I wanted to clarify, like, when did you actually start uh, working with that coach? Um, and I see that, like, in, in your rating progress, like, as you said, right, you had this minus 96 points in the Parachin B. I don't know if you played multiple tournaments there. But um, yeah, did you get the coach after that or before that? Because if before, then... Was there a feeling like, oh, maybe like this coaching is all for nothing, like maybe I should give up with the coach, or were there any of these thoughts at all? No, no. Uh, in general, uh, I, I started, I, I believe in May or April, somewhere around there. Mm, uh -huh. In and general, how our tournaments are structured is in the beginning of June, we have the Macedonian Youth Championship. Uh, and that's very big stress as this was the last year and it's very important to win the whole tournament to go to both the European and the World Youth Championship. I see, I see, okay. So that was a very important result. Uh, continuing the summer, I usually play in Parachin and in uh, Belgrade. And later that summer I went to Czechia to tournaments I played there. But I got in touch with the coach following, I think it was May or April. Uh -huh. um, and I didn't believe that, uh, I believed in the coach very much. And I think the coach believed in me as well. Right. Our work was very, very well put off. We worked on some of my weaknesses and openings and everything. But yeah, in general, I never gave up. I think that was uh, very important. Okay, yeah. And I can see that, yeah, the coach came like just before, like some good results as well. So... I guess, you know, you've already got some confidence with the coach. It's not like your first result after the training is like minus 100 points. Otherwise, that might maybe have been slightly different. But yeah, no, it, it seems, sounds good. Like that was your your overall uh, result with, with the coaching. So, hmm. Uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to ask. So I'll get this up for the viewers. And again, you'll disappear for a second as I uh, get these results. Um, so... Yeah, the, the, the month where you gained this 350 points. So for the viewers, just to clarify, uh, Theodore's under 18, so he gets the K factor 40. And um, yeah, like you played these two tournaments with K40, but I want to ask, um, in, in these two tournaments, uh, you know, after your first good result, right? So you gain like 170 points. Was there any doubt in your mind where you're like, ah, oh, crap, like, you know, the next tournament... Like, what if I get minus 170 and it's all, like, for nothing? Or was it always just, like, 
okay, I'm not gonna worry about that stuff. Like, I'm just gonna play another good tournament and smash it. And yeah, what was the feeling there? Mm, to preface this great result, uh, I have to say that before going to Czechia, uh, I had a lot of pressure on my shoulders uh, from my parents. Ah, basically okay. saying something along the lines of, "If you, if this is your last trip, go there just to have fun, but no, no more chess." This is. Oh, end. okay, okay. And that's really got to me. That's what we got to me. I didn't want that to be the end. Right. I want when I quit chess, I want it to be on my terms. Yes. Uh, so that was amazing mot motivation to strike. Yeah. Mm, in general, to Czechia, I went to a friend's house. It was generous enough. We play, played both tournaments together. Uh -huh. uh, Michael, shout out to Michael. Nice. Uh, yeah. So I had a couple of days in between tournaments. Before the tournament, we had a week of preparing. Me and him. We played a whole a week. Blitz, blitz games. Yeah. Oh, that's so, sick. Maybe even more than a week. Okay. Yeah. In general, solving some puzzles from book. Playing blitz games, which was quite nice. Uh, in an opening, I didn't play, but it was uh -huh. it was nice training for him and me. And in why? General, why an was... opening that you didn't play? Oh, I mean, uh, I was angry. I'm a French player, and I was angry at the French. So, and I want uh, he wanted to play the car against the Karakhan. So ah, I see. I see to help train each other. I, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's helping yeah. each other, and I mean, I don't know. I wanted to try, but in general, uh -huh. uh, every day we went for walks every day we trained every day i trained uh, he he's a more of a walker okay uh, i like to do calisthenics mostly uh -huh. uh, and running as well uh yeah so everything was perfect let's say right uh, the first right tournament was in Prague, the Prague open a very strong open tournament and in general czechia is a great place because everything is quite cheap uh entrances hotels are quite cheap Mm -hmm. uh, for Eng for English standards, right? Mm. And yeah, the first tournament went well. And I also have to preface this by saying, I had a goal for myself of twenty one hundred. Okay. Uh, or I think at that point I was rated eighteen hundred thirty. Right. So the goal was to gain two hundred and seventy points. <laughs> That's the most insane goal I've ever had. Like, like, how did you come up with? Like, this number, like, you felt, okay, you've got K40, you can do it, kind of feeling, yeah. No, no, uh, it was more based on a friend that had a similar ra rating. Aha, so the okay. Youth championships, yeah. The youth championships, uh, I ended up sharing first place, and uh -huh. I got second place, which is devastation here, right. because you don't get to play in neither the European nor the I see. Uh, World Youth Championship. But this year, we didn't know this, me and my opponent. It was a great family, me and my opponent. We both had uh, an equal number of points. Uh -huh. But uh, a draw for him was good because he had better tie breaks. Right. Uh, so I had the white pieces, I had to push for the win. I got a winning position, but I mean, I didn't manage to convert. The uh -huh. game didn't draw. Following that, uh, we were after the game, we were informed that actually... One of us is going to world. One of us is going to European. Ah, that okay. Insane. Same. I mean, if they said that, would have drawn the game very quickly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, wow. Insane pressure. They should have told us that earlier, but right. Speaking of that, uh, he had a very high rating of twenty one hundred, and I didn't feel that uh, I was any worse in in any regard. Right. Right. I see. I see. Yes, okay. Yeah, I guess like having having like a rival really helps motivate you. I mean, I remember with basketball for me, I remember like in, I think end of year 11 in school, like year 12 or something. Um, yeah, I was really bad at basketball, but I had two friends that were really good. And I was just like not having it. I was like, I want, I want to be able to like beat them in street basketball. And then, okay, that gave me a lot of motivation. And then eventually I did manage to beat them, right? So yeah, I think like, Right, like, yeah, people underestimate like how useful having a like some kind of rival is to actually push you to get to that that goal. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. My my issue right now actually is that my my biggest chess rival is uh, a thirteen year old, and two days ago he just beat a GM in classical, first time. So he's gone from like being like some kid who I would smash to now smashing me more often than I smash him, and now he's just beaten a GM as well. So. 
this this is very soul crushing as a rival because whatever I do, it's like I'm I'm playing catch up, and it's like I don't know. I'm pouring water into like some bucket that has ten thousand holes, and it's yeah, the catch up is rough. But okay, it's it's still nice to like give me some motivation to like yeah, keep playing. By the way, was he your student or? Kinda, kinda. I mean, he's never had a coach, and if he were to say who his one coach might be, then it could be me. So I, I have teach, taught him some stuff, but I told him from the start that, yeah, I'm not your coach because in a few months you're going to be better than me. So we'll consider ourselves training partners. So actually, like in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go around to his and we're going to do Duretsky's Rook End Games. And just, I don't know, like I've never studied it actually, and he's way too lazy to, to bother. So it's a good team and we'll, we'll see how far we get. Um, but yeah, I think like, yeah, at some point he probably needs a coach, but okay, he seems to be doing something right. So, like, yeah. Um, Definitely. What's his rating, if I may ask? Uh, his FIDE, I think, is 1950. But the thing is, when you play in the UK, you don't gain any FIDE. So his is he beat GM Mark Hepton in the league, like, two days ago. So I think, yeah, his ECF, uh, his national rating is 2100. Uh, and, yeah, the GM is, like, close to 2500. I think 25-something, so... Yeah, pretty pretty sick result, um, and yeah, it, it yeah it, like oh, it's crazy. Like the the game, it, it felt like um, the GM was the amateur as well. It's just insane, insane. Like really? killed him, killed him so badly. Yeah, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. What I wanted to ask as well. So again, you're gonna disappear for a second as I mess around with Chrome, um, but yeah, I I just wanted to. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, like, okay, after this 350-point game, like, yeah, suddenly from being in tournaments, like, let's say you're playing in an open tournament and you're playing up maybe a lot of the rounds, suddenly you might actually be playing down a lot of the rounds. So did this kind of affect, like, you know, your mindset in any way, either within chess or outside of chess? Like, how was that, or did it not bother you? I mean, following my results... I had a rating near 2200, uh -huh. which was a sign for me that, I mean, okay, I have 120 more points of Fide Master. I have okay. to push for it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if you thought that getting uh, from 1800 to 2200 was difficult, <laughs> by getting from 1800 to 2300. Yeah. yeah. So that was the goal. Mm, I went to Berlin for my first tournament. Uh, I, in general, I played three tournaments following Czechia. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, I played in Berlin, a Berlin Open, because in general, German ratings are slightly more inflated. I agree. I felt this. Okay. Uh, I had a, a slight minus in that tournament, but in general, when you have a very good performance, you're pretty much due to have slight... I call it rating. What's it called? Mm. Rating decrease. Basically, you're, yeah. you you need to stabilize the rating a bit first of all. Uh -huh. uh, unless you're one of those juniors who's has IM or GM strength. Right. So generally, your rating gets a bit corrected. Following that, uh, I played in the World Youth Championship, which was in Italy. A great city in Monte Silvano. Had a blast there. But again, things didn't go my way just wise. Uh -huh. Following that, I also played in Skopje. I played in a national league here and lost some points because at that point I thought that it was impossible to get Fidia Master by, by the end of the year. Now right. looking back at it, if I put my mind to it, I think if I played well in the league, Right. And in Skopje Open, I could have found one more tournament to push it. Right, right. Yeah, that's right. But in general, I believe that if you want to, if you want something really badly, you will get it. That's interesting, right. interesting. Okay, because I mean, you've also got like the opposite philosophy where it's like when you when you stop like searching for a thing, then you find it kind of thing. Maybe that's something slightly different, but... Uh, yeah, I guess I guess maybe it did work for you in some way though, because like you know you wanted that twenty one hundred, you like had this kind of ultimatum from your parents, and you just went for it and you got it right. So, yeah, it's 
it's interesting but i i wonder like yeah it's like yeah i mean then your new goal is this feeding master and then this is also playing on your mind a bit as well so yeah i guess like you've probably got to find like the balance of finding the goal to motivate you but then not have a goal that actually pushes you too far where you suddenly start overthinking about like i don't know can i get there like do i squeeze in one tournament here to get this before the end of the year like maybe like there should be a better way of like i don't know get reaching that goal i'm not too sure i think the overthinking part is incorrect i believe this because if you really want to do something you'll find a way Aha, i don't okay. think i want to be a feeding master as much it was a nice goal just to push myself because just to continue playing chess for a bit right because in general when you get k20 it's a bit more difficult to climb of course if you want right. to continue in chess you, you can definitely do it but in general yep. Well, I believe in due time, if you want something in due time, if you have enough time, you will definitely reach it. It's impossible. Because I don't know if you can pull up my feed page, but uh -huh. I had been stuck at this 18, 1900 rating mark for a long time. I don't know if you can check it. Yeah, I can, I can show. So, yeah, you got to 1900 in February 2022. And then, uh, yeah, in July 2023, so a year and a bit, we're still kind of at 1900 level even dipping below 1900 right like in august 2023 uh 1829 so yeah this this plateau um actually how did you feel during uh this plateau did you feel like you were still improving and just the results weren't showing and like what did that do for you mentally like what was where was your head at during that plateau definitely i felt like i was improving and i didn't care a lot about the results and the rating uh-huh I have to add this a little bit of a tangent. Right now I'm doing a project for my school on the ELO rating system. Oh, okay. And I've been studying it a bit. And in general, the, pr the purpose of the ELO rating system is mm, it's not perfect, and especially in the short term. But the point is, in the long term, it will definitely be a solid reflection of your chest strength. Right. So I believe that... If you were to focus enough and if you want to do something, that you will do it. Maybe, uh, and I'd also like to add that you shouldn't focus on your rating at all. Because for a couple of tournaments, a lot of factors vary. In general, in yeah. chess tournaments, as you know, a lot of factors vary. Sometimes you may have an argument, sometimes, I don't know, the weather is bad. I don't know. Right, Everything right. Everything affects. But in the long term, you will definitely get to the strength where you right. Are. Yeah, that's actually something I need to take on board more as well, because I've actually received this criticism. Uh, okay, maybe not criticism is too harsh, but basically this word of advice that I feel like when I play, I can get demoralized very quickly. So I can, you know, be playing actually some really nice chess, and then I have one bad game and I think I'm terrible, and then I quit for like several months, which is just not the right way. And as you said, it kind of stabilizes after enough games. So like probably in these moments, I need to just keep playing even if it feels like yeah there's all kinds of things wrong and actually just confront these things and just keep playing um but yeah good, interesting to hear your thoughts during this plateau um yeah i think it's very important actually uh especially in serbia the tournaments before czechia right it was i had a lot of losses i had an insane amount of losses but i think the thing that kept me up was the fact that i wanted i really wanted to play and to win Right. Maybe not so much in Parachin, but definitely in Belgrade I played, I think, 14 games. Right. Losing most of them. I think I finished on around 50%, uh -huh. which playing in the B group isn't very good. Yeah. But in general, I think the will to play chess needs to be there. Every day I really wanted to, to play, which right, right. I think was the key thing. Yeah, and that actually maybe is then my problem, actually, because uh, my my mood in terms of chess can fluctuate within, like, a few days. So I can be, like, really, really loving chess and then suddenly be like, I really don't want to get to the board and play. And this is a problem. And I think when I would play as a kid, uh, like, I would always just be happy to play. And I don't know what to really change. Like, why, why suddenly, like, my... I think my tolerance to 
mental stress and mental pain just like you know became really crap <laughs> uh so like i would just you know I, and i think maybe it's just like from uh like when you experience more of life at least for me i feel like there's so many like good aspects of life i suddenly reach this point where i'm feeling like why am i even causing myself this pain when i can just be like happy and maybe it's you know there are all kinds of good reasons why you might want to put yourself through the pain for like you know i guess some greater good eventually but in the moment like like i can find like a hundred reasons not to want to play and this is the issue and then it gets in my head and then it's difficult to play <laughs> i mean i think everything comes back to if you really want it right right do you really want do you really want it i'm asking you this Uh huh. Well, I mean, in terms of like um, goals that I actually really care about, then yes. Like this, like uh, let's say to like reach some kind of higher rating than I've been stuck at for the last ten years. Yeah, sure. Like this, this is something like I would really want. But the thing is, I know that in the past I've been at a point where um, I had even more passion than I do now. So when I say I really want this goal. Okay, maybe you're right. Yeah, I don't really, really, really want it, but there has been times where I did really, really, really want it, and I also um, put in the work for it. But I guess the problem back then was like I also had all these other problems that would then be like really difficult hurdles to cross. Whereas now maybe I could cross those hurdles. So yeah, I think it's yeah. If I could somehow reignite that passion to really, really want it, then I think then there's definitely more chance now than there was like five, ten, like however long ago um so i i think yeah the seeds are there for for some potential growth but yeah i i think like right now at least actually yeah like being super good at chess isn't like the only thing that's uh necessarily on my mind and i've got some like exciting plans in other not only chess stuff but other stuff as well so it's like yeah it's it's interesting um but yeah what one more thing i wanted to add was uh or ask was like If you could give like any like really big, maybe secrets to chess improvement that you've come across, uh, that maybe like was like the biggest contributor to um, this this big this big growth. I mean, like from my understanding, like you know, this growth didn't just come overnight. It was like over the whole plateau, and you were improving in strength even if your rating didn't show it. Um, but yeah, like any any like maybe secrets or tips that yeah might be uh might be less commonly known like yeah it'd be interesting to hear if you had any i have two one of them uh-huh. is one you told me i don't know if you remember you told me this one in parachin uh uh-huh. you talked to a guy who became an international master uh-huh who checked his twitter and actually tried to solve puzzles Or position that he got on Twitter. I don't know. If yes, I do remember. And actually, the uh, the guy uh, is actually a chess lifestyle viewer. Although I don't think he watches my videos anymore, having like you know gotten really good. But he started off watching my videos right at the start. He's called Jimin Jamon. Uh, I yes. think. Yeah. But the point of that one was that he was actively trying to solve them because his whole central goal was to become better. Or I don't know if he specifically wanted to become to become an IM. But uh-huh. I think everything ties go back to to point number one. If you really want something, go get it. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, let me just clarify this Twitter Twitter comment as well. So basically I met a guy in my Menorca tournament and he came up to me actually and just said like, oh you know I, I watch some of your YouTube videos so sometimes this happens and we have a nice chat. And I asked him like oh you know like how you doing like which uh like like how's your result? Um And yeah, like I, I think I, he said that he was in the A tournament, and then he he said like he was on like like two and a half out of four or something. I was like, that's insane! Like this is a really tough tournament. Like you know, like what what's your rating and stuff? And he was like, oh, you know, twenty four fifty. And I was just like, no way! Is like a like he's watching my YouTube videos and he's twenty four fifty. But he actually had a similar growth uh, as YouTube. Though. So like he had like two months where in both months he gained two hundred points. Um, Which is kind of insane because he gained 200 points as like a 1900 and then 200 points as a 2100. Like just back to back, it just had four incredible tournaments uh, back to back. But yeah, this was this was his 
biggest advice for me, which uh, you've mentioned now, uh, which is, yeah, for him, like he realized like he will just try and solve every exercise that comes his way. So whether it's something his coach is mentioning, whether it's something a friend has mentioned, uh, whether it's something he's just seen like on chess Twitter, right? Like whatever it is, like he will actually take this as an opportunity to actually solve it. And just all of his extra practice where like in the past he would have just scrolled past it or just like, you know, every little bit just kind of like gave him that extra um, extra improvement. And like eventually, I guess, same with uh, you, Theodore, like how like, you know, you're improving and then suddenly it just takes this like, you know, everything to be right. You know, you've got the perfect conditions, you've got a friend you're playing with, like everything is right. And then you can see this big, big growth. So um yeah that's 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 the point and yeah this is this is nice so i i wanted to ask you said you had two secrets to chess improvement so did you already save a second one with what you said or or is there a second one uh, if you want something you'll get it right 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 yeah <laughs> wasn't sure if that was the second one or not but yeah exactly if you really want something you can get it right now just a just a comment on this as, as much as i love the slogan and like I, i'm yeah, I'm glad it's it's been working for you, I guess, even though you've had this plateau. I, I, I know that when I was, um, it was actually during the pandemic where, I, I mean, I'd started this YouTube channel in the first pandemic and then it was kind of like the second pandemic and I realized like, yeah, I don't really want anything else in life except to be good at chess. I didn't even care about the rating or anything. I just wanted to know in deep inside that, okay, I'm actually really good at chess, uh, which, okay, of course, this is very difficult, right? So... I, I really I really took it seriously like um, I at the time like I was you know socializing I had like quite a lot of friends in London and yeah I had my work and you know I had some relationships kind of stuff um, but I cut it all out uh, apart from my work like I, I needed to pay my bills um, so I had work and I had chess um, and I feel like in life actually this is something I've kind of come to recently which I feel like there are all these things that are important right you've got like family work your passion, uh, relationships, friends, like maybe these five things are like really big. Um, but in reality, in 24 hours each day, you don't really have time to fulfill all of these five things. So to me, it's like you kind of either do a bit of everything where it's not going to really be fulfilled or you like uh, cut some of them for the time being, really focus on the others. Um, and okay, these have their pros, it has their cons. But for me in that moment, I felt like nothing else really matters except for this. So I cut out everything, so friends, family, uh, relationships, and just focused on chess and work. And I really gained a lot. So I was working a lot with Nicola in this time. And uh, I'd, I'd, until this point, I'd actually never attacked the king in my whole chess career, up to, like I'd gotten to 1900 FIDE and never attacked the king. So I was finally learning like how to checkmate, which is ridiculous. And yeah, like I feel like um, I improved so much. But the crazy thing was that like in about four months, I think I went from like zero in terms of this type of chess to a 2000 player. Like I made 2000, but I was playing a completely opposite chess to like what I normally was playing. So um, and then the thing is, I kind of plateaued at that level as well. And then it kind of hurts, right? Because for me, like I was seeing this growth where I was in between 1900 and 2000 and I was still between 1900 and 2000. I was just a completely different player. So it's, it's weird, but I think on the whole, I'm trying to think where I was going with this. Yeah, my, my, where I was going with this was that uh, your, 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 your mantra, your, your second secret that you mentioned, like, you know, if you really want something, you can get it. I think it's true, but... Um, it can take a lot of time, which is what you've clarified as well. And I think like, even though I really, really wanted it and I really did dedicate like four or five months of my life where I was really just focusing on this one thing, there were definitely results, but also not the results in the moment that I could really feel happy with. I felt like I'd put this four or five months in and I really wasn't where I was wanting to be at. And this was very demoralizing. And then like things slowed down a lot and I, decided, okay, maybe there's more to life than just like uh, doing this every day for five months. And yeah, things kind of, yeah, like became a bit more normal again. And yeah, I'm still kind of at this level because even though like, yeah, some, some games I've played, like some tremendous games, like doing feats that I've never been able to do, like like converting rook and bishop against rook against a 2000 
in a classical tournament playing like six hours and converting this this is like something i could never literally get close to or like i even had this game where i would consider i actually asked you to watch it Theodore, like um uh, back on the trip like this immortal game video i don't know if you ever got around to watching it I think I watched it, but right now I don't remember. Okay, okay, yeah. But yeah, like I played like probably, to me at least, I felt like the, the best game of my career. So I think, yeah, these are also like, even if the rating is still on this somewhat plateau, I think, yeah, like that, that hard work that was put in, it's not gone to waste. And if I do ever reignite that passion, I will get there. So I think, I think like I, I do agree in conclusion, uh, with with this this point, but it's definitely very nuanced and yeah, not not so simple as like you just want it and you'll get it because yeah, I, of of everyone I know, like probably aside from maybe one other person, I don't know anyone else who has like had as much determination and drive to be good at chess than me and maybe this one person, and yet I haven't had this this big growth. Um, so I think it's not the only thing that you need. You need like some more factors as well, but yeah, for sure. Like if you have this plus some nice factors to get you through the hurdles, then yeah, you're, you're going to be doing great. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I also want to mention one more thing. Yeah, please, please. I, I don't know if I should, but I mean, <laughs> there's also the saying that necessity is the mother of invention. Aha. So to yes. g put this into context, this is like when your parents are like, yeah, this is your last tournament, Theodore, make it count. Like you feel the necessity to, you know, sesh it and you sesh it. So exactly. yeah. And this is my problem as well, right? Like suddenly I've been given this opportunity. Okay. When I say given, I mean like myself has given myself this opportunity to go travel the world and like, live like a king and yeah like suddenly i don't have the necessity to like you know sesh this chess and i mean the other problem as well is like like yeah i suddenly started having all of these like doubts as to whether like being better at chess is even something i want like right now i can kind of be at this like mediocre level okay you can argue whether it's mediocre or already very good or whatever but okay mediocre in my eyes um like at this mediocre level and it means that i can kind of relate uh to a lot of uh players whereas if i felt like i was like a, a grandmaster already then suddenly i think like the way i would be able to see chess like i'm kind of maybe having some kind of disconnect with like beginners or weaker players um i mean okay maybe if i come came from this beginner level maybe i can still keep this connection but I don't know, I remember like when I was playing uh, a club night in Hammersmith in London and uh, it just so happened that Grandmaster Daniel King, who you might know from his educational content, like he, he was at the club. I remember like I'd watched some of his videos as a kid, so I was like super hyped. And I actually really regret this in a way because um, at the time I was actually having this like really intense chess period, right? Where I was doing only chess. Um, I think this was at the similar time, or maybe it was just past it. But in any case, I was very into chess at that moment. And when I played him, like, all I could care about was just, like, playing him, giving it my best shot to beat him, use it as training. And when we played, like, he, he said something like, oh, I can, I can tell you're very keen, or something like this. And we didn't even talk, because he didn't have any interest talking to me, because I'm just another chess player who cares a lot about chess. I'm not like very interesting. So in the end, he spent most of the night with some 1400. They played like, I don't know, a dozen games and they were just talking about random stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It felt like when I did talk to him, it felt like he didn't really like chess anymore. He felt like he was beyond his peak and yeah, he's just not, I mean, he's just here for a drink, not really for the chess. And also like in the moment, like it, it, it felt like he couldn't even enjoy a club session because everyone was like obsessing over him right including myself which is why i said i feel a bit of regret because like i probably made his night like you know uh worse than it than it should have been but i think this also comes with just being a stronger player like you're just going to get that you're going to get more respect in this in this way and yeah when i was when i was like trying to climb i was thinking like you know is this even something 
something I want. But okay, GM is a very long way away and, you know, we can be better players without having any kind of problems in that regard, at least for the time being. So, yeah. But yeah, these kind of like, yeah, all kinds of, all kinds of <laughs> overthinking, you could say, creeping in to like the discussion of chess improvement. Um, ah, I've got one more question actually that came to mind, which is you said like you started with this uh, chess coach uh, in April of last year. Um, what is what exactly do you guys train, and what aspects do you think like like worked really really well in terms of like leading to your improvement? I think being exposed <clears throat> to different coach was very helpful. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, because with Dragon we have been working together for four years, which right. is a long time, and I basically, he basically taught, taught me everything he could. Uh -huh. and yeah. At least I feel that way. Right. Well, this other coach is a coach that uses engines a lot and is very up to date. Everything. I see. I see. New, this is we started by looking at my games from the past year and a half too. And after that, he identified what he thought were some of my weaknesses and wanted to improve on them. Uh -huh. And I think we did a decent job. I also had a couple of sessions broadening my repertoire, uh -huh. which was quite useful. And in general, in pattern recognition, we solved a lot of pat pattern related. For example, in the Queen's Gambit, we solved a lot I of see. patterns, which were very important. I mean, everybody knows the classic minority attack, but right. In general, the, I, I've been a D4 player for my entire life, uh -huh. and I've never once played a minority attack. I can tell you this. Oh, uh, okay, interesting. <laughs> right, right. Okay, yeah. so yeah, I guess filling the gaps of your knowledge, uh, and I guess yeah, that's what a what a good coach should really do. I mean, I think for me, it's like that's why like I, I do have some. Uh, older students as well as uh, stronger students and I guess in a way like these students are more demanding because yeah you've really got to think hard about how you're going to elevate the game but yeah as a, as a coach it's also nice like that's why I'm a really big fan of just teaching kids as well because it's much easier of a job because kids like young kids who are kind of still beginner intermediate they need to learn everything right so I don't really need to think about like where am I maximizing their time i can just literally teach them anything and it's going to be useful so um yeah from a coaching standpoint that's easier for me uh i would say but yeah interesting to interesting to hear i mean how how did you when you when you chose this coach did you kind of have some prior knowledge that it was going to go in this direction or was it quite lucky that it all worked out in terms of his style kind of filling your weaknesses I got this coach. I knew he was an amazing coach because he helped one of our juniors to get. Now he's an IM, so he's he had a very good reputation. And in general, we had group lessons with him. And I got the gist that everything will be, I will be in good hands. Right, right. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. Um. I'm I'm suddenly having some fears that <laughs> no 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 it's it's definitely all recorded so don't worry about that like these kind of fears uh but um yeah okay okay this this is better I think for the last maybe like ten minutes um I had you like slightly too low down so I've probably got like half your face uh but okay it's fine it's fine it's all good it's all good um yeah I mean the viewers are gonna appreciate what what's been spoken about way more than <laughs> the the quality of of the content um. Like production quality, I mean, yeah. Nah, that's, that's really good. I, I think I'm gonna have to like rewatch this this whole uh, whole video as well, just to like make sure I'm like I've taken on board all of these um, interesting interesting tips. Hmm. I feel like we should end on like one final question each, and then and then we'll we'll call it a day for for the viewers. Shoot, shoot. I think I'll, we'll have mm -hmm. the same question actually, but you, really, you know, really, okay. Let, let me think. Let me think. Just to try to spite <laughs> me. Try to spite you. Wow. I, I'm. <clears throat> yeah. I wish I could think of this juicy I'll question. Go first, then, okay. Yeah. Please do. Please do. 
I mean, I would have asked the generic what's in the future for you. Aha, uh -huh, okay. My, the question what uh, I thought you might ask also, is... Aha, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, aha. Uh -huh. I want to also ask you, when you're talking about the Malaysia, are they, do they play chess there? Do they have some tournaments? Or? Okay, so yeah, I'll, <clears throat> when you, your future question, I, I'm guessing you mean chess, chess-wise, right? Mm, or... Everything-wise. Okay, everything-wise, okay, okay. So, but I'll answer your second question first. So, like, uh, with Malaysia, yeah, there is some chess scene there, but in general, in East Asia, it's still quite underdeveloped, I think. Um, and especially like East Asian countries like Japan or South Korea, uh, because there they play like other very uh, high profile intellectual games like Shogi or Go. So you've got like, you know, I mean, if your top minds are playing Go, then you're going to attract more people there. And it's like, why would we bother playing chess? So I think you've got that competition. Uh, and actually in Malaysia, I think, yeah, like I think Show and Go. Uh, Shogi and Go is like kind of somewhat big, I think. But um, yeah, like I think I think like they're extremely underrated. Um, so and it's, it's it's just kind of similar to the rest of uh, Asia in the sense that a lot of the time they're just playing within their country. And since everyone's ratings are relatively low, then it's very difficult to make uh, serious gains and then you've got new kids coming in who are underrated and may bring the ratings even lower and yeah so it, it really is just very underrated and you can see from like when you look at like the Olympiad and you look at the results of uh, you know these countries like Malaysia and stuff like all of the team has like CM or like FM titles because they have got them conditionally through Olympiad because they have no problem scoring like 50% 60% 70% in the Olympiad despite being 1800 because you know they're not actually 1800 so um <clears throat> yeah there is a scene very underrated uh and but definitely like i think it's definitely growing like i think um i, I know that do you have do you know avatic gregorian from chess mood i haven't heard of him okay so chess mood is like some website that uh is for improving your chess uh, i've mentioned it maybe sometimes on my channel so the viewers probably know it but uh, he, before doing chess mood, he was a coach in Thailand. So I think like within the last like five, 10 years, there's definitely been more of like a push for bringing in some international influence and yeah, improving the scene. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there is some potential to play and I definitely will. Like if I, if I do this travel, like I'll find, I'll find a chess club somewhere and I'll play. Um, yeah, in terms of future for me. Uh, yeah, I think like this this travel plan is the immediate future. Um, I wasn't sure like how long I would be coaching chess for, but in general, I still actually quite enjoy it. Like um, even though I've been doing it for quite some years now, um, like it's nice to see the students improve and the students are evolving as well as players and people. Um, so like this it's it's not like just teaching like the same kid over and over and over like they're they're improving and changing so that keeps it interesting as well um and there are always new chess projects that are coming to mind so like right now like uh i'm actually working on a chess book course so uh i'm actually i'm actually uh i've got a call at half seven uh to talk to a supervisor um uh, about how the how the course is going so um I'll actually tell, I'll tell you in private because I'm not sure how much of this is like confidential in terms of like the specifics of the course. Uh, but in general, like Chessable uh, basically realized that, you know, since most of their like audience is uh, like more intermediate and beginner level, um, they actually found that a lot of the courses that are most successful are not from like GMs or IMs, but actually from uh, like coaches, maybe even unrated coaches who just have some kind of reputation for teaching. So, for instance, like, I don't know if you know this, like, uh, I think he's called Robert Ramirez, who's a national master. He's, like, done loads of videos on the park on YouTube. Um, anyway, like, he's, like, got a fan base. Like, he's really good at explaining things. Sure, he's not an IM or GM, but he can make a really good course, right? So, I think Chesterfield started to pick up on this, and that's why they started to look for more, like, people who could create content and then they got in touch and yeah i've we've come up with like some really interesting course i think like 
uh, yeah, like the content of this, it's, it's actually really awesome. Like I'm, I'm putting a lot of hours into making this as good as possible. So yeah, it's, it's very exciting. And if that takes off, then yeah, that will be very nice. Um, so I think for me, like, you need any, yeah. Uh -huh. you need any proto testers? Oh, absolutely. You know what? I'm going to write something now. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that you're, you're testing this. Cause I, I want your feedback on, on this course. I think, I think you're going to really like it. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that, yeah, that's how my future is looking. It's kind of like maybe some immediate plans in terms of traveling and just keeping creative and keeping open to whatever chess opportunity like comes my way. And I think that's, that's like a, a nice way to go about it. As soon as you start like really, um, I don't know, planning like the years and years and years, like in advance, like it's just going to end up changing anyway. So I don't really see the point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably my answer, answer for you. Um, but okay. A question, a question for you. Mm. Hmm. Well, the nice thing is I can edit this video. So <laughs> however long I'm thinking, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't I'll matter. I'll go take a sip of water. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I'll have a think. Uh. Okay. Uh, what do you think is your highest rating potential? And what do you think would be holding you back the most in terms of getting to that level? I mean, there are two answers. Okay. A lifetime and short term. Lifetime. Lifetime is my question. Lifetime, I, I do believe that I can cross 2,500. Okay. Nice, nice. But I don't think I want to. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So already the overthinking has started to kick in. Well, my kind of overthinking, and right? Of like, ah, uh, maybe I don't want to kind of stuff. But yeah, uh -huh. go on, go on. I don't think I will continue playing chess for a long time. It's great. I think chess should have it should have its place, uh -huh. whether it's a hobby or a profession. For you, it's a very interesting position because your living is teaching chess. Uh huh. So it's also interesting to become a better chess player. Yeah. Especially in your free time, because you can attract more students and everything. So higher your rate, that makes a lot of sense becoming a better player. Mm -hmm. But in general, chess is a lot of fun. Chess is a very fun game. Yeah. And but it should be that a game, not right. And in terms of making it a profession, it it should either be you or somebody like these kids. I mean, I don't know if you saw this year's Parachin Winter winner. Ah, uh, no, I didn't. Parachin e Winter. Okay, so it was basically like. Five grandmasters or more playing, uh -huh. and this twenty one hundred Chinese kid won uh -huh. the tournament. Damn! I mean, I, I when I saw that, that was my cue that okay, maybe it's time to slow down. <laughs> right, right. Because I mean, if you're twenty one hundred and you're he he got an IM norm as well. I have to mention this one. Right, he got an IM norm. Damn, twenty one hundred, uh, a twelve year old. I mean, well. And you know Mishra and all of these grandmasters and right Oro, like the master yeah. from Argentina. I mean, yeah. So it's like even if you can, think, uh, even if yeah, I was gonna say even if you can get to like like a GM and actually make it like a professional kind of sport for you, yeah, it's like you're constantly gonna be competing with kids who like maybe have been slightly lucky in terms of certain environmental factors and maybe even just more talented. Uh, and this is going to be very tough to like have to face these guys on a daily basis and make your living out of it, right? So, yeah, it's an interesting point. I, I don't look at it quite that way, facing these guys. Ah, okay. My point is, uh, if they could have, if they reach something at, so let's say, thirteen years old, mm -hmm. while being realistic, I could reach, let's say, GM, and let's say, well, I'm twenty-three years old. Uh -huh. so they're 10 years ahead of me. Right. So, so what's the point? Right. It's not the 
proper career path. Aha, and okay, okay, Carlson, right. I didn't know at what, and I didn't know at what age Carlson became a world champion, but I think he was 23 and a world champion. I think he got it right. a bit earlier. Uh huh. I think Kasparov got it when he was 21, becoming a world champion. Right, right. Yes. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to think if... I mean, there are some examples, like, where, you know, like... Have you heard of Jonathan Hawkins from the UK? I remember this one. We discussed it in... Part ah, we did? We did? Aha, okay, okay. I completely forgot. Uh, but yeah, for, for any of the for viewers... The viewers yeah. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. He was a working man. I don't know what job. Uh -huh. He became from a 20-something hundred player to a GM. I think 18, 1800, 1800. I think high 1800s, high 1800s. Um, yeah, <laughs> to GM. Uh, insane, yeah. insane. And like, uh, but but yeah, like the, he really wanted it, right? He really, really wanted it. And I think from the age of like, I don't know, it's like early 20s, like he just really, really worked hard and did only chess. And yeah, like, I mean, yeah, this is what you're saying, right, about your potential. Like, you know, potentially maybe GM is, is possible. And yeah, if you sacrifice everything, you can get there. And I mean, okay, Hawkins got to like 2,500, but, you know, he's not like 2,800, right? There's, there's still a gap. So, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, <clears throat> I guess it comes back to this, this second, the second point. Like, how much do you really want it? Like, how much are you going to work to find a way to actually make it happen? This is like the question, the biggest question you've got to ask yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think on that note, <laughs> we can conclude this uh, amazing video. So yeah, thank you guys all for watching and thank you Teodor for uh, sharing your chess improvement secrets to everyone watching. I mean, yeah, it's a real, a real gem of a video, I think. Uh, and yeah, any final comments from you? I'd like to thank you for inviting me and... No problem. Yeah, that's about it. Okay, sweet.